Um, good evening and welcome to our third session of our virtual patient education series, 2020 New and Emerging Treatments for Blood Cancers. With tonight's focus on MDS and AML, my name is Carrie Callis and I'm the program director um, here at the Leukemia Research Foundation. We're pleased to present this event in partnership with the Cardinal Bernadine Cancer Center at Loyola and are grateful to have our, our presenters this evening, Dr. Khan and Dr. Dinner. We would also like to thank our supporters of this evening's program, AbbVie Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Caria Farm Therapeutics, and Novartis Oncology. As a brief background about the Leukemia Research Foundation, the foundation's mission is to conquer all blood cancers by funding research into their causes and cures and enriching the quality of life of those touched by these diseases. Since its inception in 1946, the foundation has raised funds to award over $80 million of research grants to over 500 new investigators on five continents and supports patients and families living with a blood cancer diagnosis through educational and support programs. I encourage you to visit our website, allbloodcancers.org, to learn more about our patient support programs, including our patient grant program, our online support community, and our comprehensive listing of resources. So at this time, I would like to introduce um, our moderator of tonight's program, Dr. Patrick Stiff, who is the director at the Cardinal Bernadine Cancer Center at Loyola. Um, Dr. Stiff is the chair of the Foundation's Medical Advisory Board, and we thank him for all he does to advise and support our work at the Foundation. So turning it over to you, Dr. Stiff. Good morning. Good evening, I should say. I don't know what time of day it is sometimes, and I hope everybody can hear me as well. So welcome to all of you. This is the third and final um, event. It's not a debate. Sorry if those of you uh, were tuning in, hope to have a debate. We're going to have answers is what we're going to have tonight. Um, the first of the three sessions focused on uh, myeloma and mature B cell neoplasms. Second one on uh, large cell and other non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. Tonight, we're going to focus on myeloid disorders or uh, diseases that involve <laughs> Um, the uh, bone marrow of the myeloid lineage, which are the white cells, not the lymphocytes, neutrophils, blast, if you will. So acute myeloid leukemia and myelodysplastic syndrome, which for a time we called pre-leukemia because many patients ultimately transformed into acute leukemia. Again, we're going to have uh, two 20-minute presentations, and then we're going to answer questions for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes after the end of both presentations. So we're going to uh, answer again questions um, after both presentations are done. So we're going to run right through them um, uh, one after the other. Again, I'd like to thank the Leukemia Research Foundation for sponsoring this. Uh, patient information is a win-win. It's a win for patients. It's also a win for us because the more patients are educated, the more they'll be able to make informed decisions about which treatments are going to be appropriate for them, which treatments are going to be the best for them. And if they know more about the treatments before they come in to see us, they'll be able to say um, whether or not um, um, they're able to um, follow or uh, uh, tolerate a specific therapy because they'll know something about it. They'll know about the options. We used to call this the treatment options uh, conference. And certainly, again, uh, you're going to hear a lot of options. What's really exciting over the last year and two or two has been the rapid advances in the management of patients with leukemias and lymphomas. Uh, those of you who keep up with this are amazed as we are by the number of new drugs, new treatments that have been available uh, for treatment of these disorders. I think there's been a couple new treatments just for uh, myodysplastic syndrome with, approved within the last year. And unfortunately, one of the big trials turned out to be a negative trial looking at uh, alternate agents. But again, it's an exciting time because we are seeing some progress. We know more about the genetics of these diseases and are focusing on what we can do to mitigate the toxicity uh, 
of these diseases as well as the toxicity of the traditional chemotherapy that we've given for the last 40 years. Patients. The first is Arum Khan, who is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology Oncology at the University of Illinois here in Chicago. She is also, uh, I will tell you, a funded researcher for the Leukemia Research Foundation. As Carrie mentioned, uh, one of the main focuses of this organization is to fund um, cutting edge research. And Dr. Khan submitted a grant and was funded for her uh, groundbreaking research in the area that she's gonna talk about tonight. So maybe she'll touch on that um, a bit. So without further ado, we're gonna welcome Dr. Khan to uh, do her presentation. Thank you again in advance for doing this for us. Um, once again, thank you for your patience and thank you for the invitation. It's always great to be at this meeting. And this time we got a sneak preview at the questions, which was great because some of them were really um, thought provoking. So um, I'm gonna talk to you um, about myelodysplastic syndromes. And um, just on my introductory slide, I kind of wanted to show you, there's a really nice um, review published this year um, uh, by an Italian hematologist uh, in the New England Journal, kind of, and this picture really summarizes some of the conundrum we're dealing with when we um, try and diagnose us and, and determine what is the best treatment for our patient. So really, um, what we're talking about is a continuum of, of normal of blood production to leukemia and MDS, we're in the middle. So with the top panel is just normal blood production where this stem cells in your bone marrow give rise to different progenitors that have a fate to become a red cell, a white cell, or a platelet. And then along the way, you can acquire a mutation um, in, in one of these early stem cells, which may actually be very inconsequential. It may be detectable with our newer technologies, um, which can pick up very low burden of mutations of, of less than 10%. Um, and and some of these are very inconsequential, and so that's some of the conundrum in, in figuring out what's consequential and what's not. And so CHIP is really clonal hematopoiesis of individual. We have a clone, we have no idea what it's doing, but you seem to be making blood just fine. But as the as it progresses, and not everyone progresses, in fact, the very vast minority progress, um, they may acquire additional mutations where now actually there is really um, an effect on the process of maturation and the bone marrow starts to accumulate abnormalities so that when a pathologist looks at it, they say, all right, this doesn't look right. Cells are abnormal. Um, and you can stay there also. You can hang out there for a long time or you can then go on to develop additional mutations that give some of those cells a real advantage where they really start to take over and you start having this very monotonous looking bone marrow where all the cells sort of look the same, none of them are developing. And then when you have 20% or so of these cells, um, that becomes acute myeloid leukemia. So just to bear in mind, this is a continuum. And what Dr. Dinner was um, very nicely summarizing was the treatment for leukemias, but I'm gonna focus a little bit on this um, phase of MDS. Um, all right, let's see. So um, when we talk about just the epidemiology of MDS, um, as with most malignancies, it's a disease of the aging because it's usually the acquisition of mutations as I showed you, which tends to increase with age as our mechanisms to identify mutations and rectify them or eliminate them slow down. Um, so usual, the um, overall incidence is five per 100,000, but as you get over 70 or 80, that may approach more like 20 to 30 per 100,000, making it the most common of the myeloid malignancies. Um, I like this slide and um, I frequently show it because I think it really nicely captures some of the um, the challenges that um, that patients as well as phys physicians face when dealing with MDS. It's a very heterogeneous group of diseases and a patient can hang out in a very low risk stage for a long time. And so this is just um, a depiction of what would happen if 100 patients um, were diagnosed today and sort of how it would bear out for them. Um, over the course of their life. So if we look at the first six here, they would be high risk at presentation. We would consider a transplant upfront, out of which two would be cured, three would relapse in the green, and one would have transplant related complications. 12 patients would die of bleeding related complications related to low platelets, so not the majority. Two would have iron overload problems, which happens as a consequence of both the transfusions we give, as well as just the fact that red cell production is a little bit ineffective in MDS, and there's a lot of abnormal iron metabolism. 
20 patients of that 100, so that's a fifth, will have infectious complications um, that will be fatal. We'll have anemia-related complications, meaning low red cells leading to um, heart attacks and strokes um, and organ dysfunction of that nature. 24, so that's the vast chunk, um, the ones that will have complications, will progress to AML. And that's what we really uh, want to prevent. And we need to identify these patients as early as possible. Uh, because out of these, if you do try and treat them once they become AML, um, they are a subset that tends to be a little bit more resistant to treatment. And uh, transplant outcomes are uh, a lot more modest than if they were transplanted in the MDS phase or if they had AML that did not arise from pre-existing MDS. And lastly, just to remember, 29 of these, so almost um, a third, will have completely unrelated causes, like geriatric causes that will lead to their ultimate demise. And so not everybody needs something, um, unlike um, a lot of the malignancies we think about. So how do we tease through um, you know, these very different clinical courses? Uh, so traditionally, we've relied on clinical and cytogenetic markers, and these include, and, and these comprise what we call the RIPSS, or the Revised International Prognostic Scoring System, which I've just summarized here. It's a scale of, the, um, it's a scale of basically, uh, I guess it goes up to over six, but we add up all of these points. And I think it's important to know it's been revised over the years to really give a little bit more weightage to the percentage of blasts, which are those immature cells in the marrow, as well as the um, cytogenetics. So the chromosomal architecture, just like Dr. Diener mentioned in, um, in AML, are heavily driving outcomes in MDS. So we really look at those very carefully. And really anything above a 3, 3.5, we start thinking pretty quickly about transplant if, if possible. Um, and in recent years, like um, in, in AML, the identification of mutations have added value to our ability to prognosticate. And while a number of mutations are still difficult to interpret, there are a few that have been able to independently add value to our existing prognostic scoring system. And so five mutations were identified in 2011, which include P53, which we'll talk a little bit about, and a few others like ASXL, RONX1. Um, and uh, these tend to add an additional point to the traditional prognostic scoring system. So a low risk um, in the absence of a mutation lies here, but it kind of, in the presence of one of those mutations, joins the intermediate risk and so on. So everybody gets an additional point. So there is some value in looking for these mutations if they are well validated. Um, so to answer the question of do I care about the genomic characteristics of my disease, um, so there's, you know, um, a lot of uh, data that we get when we start looking for mutations and really, as I showed you, a, a number of people can have a clone that's completely inconsequential. So really discerning something that's a bystander or something that's going to cause a problem is, is, is complicated, but um, I think there is value. Um, and so we know that about 90% of patients carry some mutation. Majority of these are in splicing factors, which is how the cells handle RNA. So DNA has to be turned into RNA, which is then turned into protein. Um, so that machinery is disrupted very commonly in MDS. Um, and then DNA methylation is a second pathway, and that's uh, which genes are turned on and off. So these are very global mechanisms that are altered and are probably sort of disease drivers of, of MDS in general. Um, and uh, as I told you, these five mutations have an um, adverse prognostic value, so they help us triage somebody we might be on the fence about to something more aggressive like a transplant. And then there's actually a favorable mutation in a factor gene called SF3B1, which tends to predict a better outcome in um, low-risk MDS, but also um, now responds to a treatment, which we'll talk about. Um, and so, and as Dr. Jenner mentioned, a lot of with clinical context and multiple coexisting mutations. So it's not straightforward. Um, and lastly, you know, um, targeted therapies, uh, which are sort of the utopia for us all. Um, some of these mutations are leading to to that. As we learn what they do and the and the pathways that they make the cells vulnerable to, we develop targeted therapies. And that's where the IDH1 and 2 inhibitors come into play, which are present about 10% of MDS patients. Um, and then P53 mutations, and we'll talk about a novel class of drugs developed here, which I think is pretty exciting. 
And, um, you know, splicing factors, of course, is, uh, is very tempting to target because it's the chunk of MDS. It's been challenging, but um, there are spliceosome inhibitors that are in, in early clinical development. Um, and so I think that's an area that's scientifically very interesting. We have yet to see how effective it is um, as it moves forward clinically. Um, so uh, just kind of broadly, when we think about MDS, we think about the low risk and the high risk, and that's based on that um, IPSS score that I showed you, um, where the low risk really we're interested in trying to improve our patients' blood counts, reduce iron overload, and improve their quality of life, because we know that their um, survival is not uh, impacted early on. Um, whereas high risk MDS, we're talking about a pretty high risk of progression to leukemia and all our attention is directed to our delaying that and trying to actually um, cure them prior to that and improve their survival. So when we talk about low risk MDS, um, the commonest presentation of that is anemia. Most patients have low red cells, far more so than low platelets. Um, and so um, an early sort of mainstay of treatment has been, in addition to blood transfusions, giving agents that stimulate increased blood production. And those are erythropoiesis stimulating agents like erythropoietin or darbopoietin, which stimulates progenitor cells in the bone marrow to make more red cells. And um, these have been used in the United States based on phase two data, but in Europe, they recently conducted a phase three study very clearly showing that patients uh, randomized to getting um, ipoitin, which was uh, their formulation there, versus placebo, had um, a markedly improved um, transfusion-free survival. So again, the outcomes in these studies are usually freedom from transfusion, not survival, because that's not the problem with low-risk MDS. And um, the Nordic group came up with a way to predict who would respond to these drugs. Um, and it's usually the patients who are not so heavily transfusion dependent, so needing less than two units a month. Um, and with low erythropoietin levels of their own, because if they're making their own erythropoietin, because this is a hormone that the kidneys make, then they're probably saturated and more won't help. So there are some things that we can use to decide if this is going to help, but it's a relatively low um, risk intervention and can give responses of um, over a year, sometimes up to two years. It's important to realize that if you drive the hemoglobin up too high, there is a risk of blood clots. And so we always watch um, where the hemoglobin is. Um, for patients who progress on um, erythropoiesis stimulating agents or for some reason don't respond to them, um, various immune suppressive agents were explored and one of them was lenalidomide, um, which is a drug you know um, probably from the myeloma literature. Um, so uh, the amides are drugs that affect the immune system, but um, they were found to be very effective in a subset of MDS patients that have an abnormality in chromosome 5. Q, which is um, the one arm of chromosome 5. And in patients with this subset, um, they found really high responses and did a dedicated clinical trial in patients with just this genetic abnormality. Um, as you can imagine, that's a big undertaking because this is not uh, that common a subset. Um, but they were able to show um, that 50% of patients uh, on low doses of lenalidomide, they tested two doses, 5 and 10 milligrams, had up to 50% response rate compared to placebo, which did not. And uh, again, responses are really transfusion independence, which continued for, you know, a couple of years for um, the median. So, the, you know, 50 percent. So um, that was pretty impressive and um, led to and this was identified pretty early in 2006. And so this drug is FDA approved for this indication in the non. And, and the reason for this benefit is because um, there is a gene on 5Q that's missing that makes these cells particularly vulnerable to um, affecting a pathway that lenalidomide affects. So it's it's based on a, a chromosomal change. Um, for patients without 5Q, um, it has also been looked at. The response rates are a little bit more modest, more in the range of um, 25 to 30 percent, and a shorter duration of response, more like 30 weeks compared to 100. So certainly when you have a drug with a clear-cut target, be very dramatic. Um, now there's a new drug which is very exciting because uh, um, not only is it pretty effective, but it's also very well tolerated. So um, this is a first-in-class um, drug which targets TGF beta. TGF beta is um, um, basically a sort of short-lived hormone that uh, when it binds to it recep its receptor, it can prevent um, red cells from finishing maturation. So they get kind of developmentally arrested. They're almost mature, but they don't make that final step to make the red cells. 
And so if we were to able to prevent this interaction of TGA beta with its receptor, we could release the cells from that block. Um, and this pathway called SMAD, which is really the pathway that's making trouble. And so they devised a drug that basically mimics the receptor in part and is the rest of it is fused to a human um, immunoglobulin sequence. And it's a trap and it binds to all the ligands so that the ligand cannot bind to its natural receptor. And so that SMAD pathway is not activated, allowing um, red cell production to take place normally. And so this results in a pretty impressive improvement in hemoglobin. Um, and this happens relatively early within the first two, three, uh, two to three cycles and is sustained, um, as you can see here, going on to week 25. This is a drug versus placebo um, in the phase three medalist trial. And this um, led and the, the response rate, like 40 percent of patients almost were transfusion independent compared to 13 percent in placebo. And um, that resulted in this drug being given FDA approval in um, April of this year. Um, I think it's important to mention that the phase two studies showed that really this works in patients that have that spliceosome mutation called SF3B1. And so um, the phase three study was done in patients that had that mutation or um, physical evidence of abnormal red cell production, which is called ring sidroblasts. So it's patients with ring sidroblasts or this SF3B1 mutation that were um, given this drug and had this um, response. Immunosuppressive therapy has been around for a long time in MDS. Um, it's only a subset of MDS that really responds, and that's pretty clear in this retrospective study um, done across um, over 10 countries. They looked at 207 patients treated with immunosuppressive therapy. Um, the idea being a subset of MDS is, is related to a dysregulated immune system, and so maybe suppressing that allows normal blood production. And they saw that response rates um, were in the range of about 50%, because if you include the, um, the remissions as well as hematologic improvement, that's about half the pie. This is 207 patients, so it took 15 countries, and this is very few patients. So this is not a common modality used, but for the responders, they did improve their survival. And when they look to see who really responds to immune suppression, it's patients that have a very empty bone marrow. Uh, which is called hypocellular. Most of MDS uh, patients have a very full bone marrow because the cells are trying really hard to divide and make blood, but they're ineffective. But about 10% of patients have an emptier bone marrow looking more like uh, aplastic anemia, which is a benign disease. And so these guys are somewhere in the middle of a benign and malignant process. And their survival and the risk of transformation to leukemia shown in these graphs on the left um, in the red is sort of intermediate between that of aplastic anemia, which is green and has a beautiful survival curve, and then hypercellular MDS, which has a less favorable survival curve. So hypocellular somewhere in the middle and um, may respond to immune suppression. So I think that's important to consider. And within the immune suppression, it was cyclosporin and ATG that seemed to work best. Um, then we also um, have a small subset of MDS patients that have problems with low platelets and bleeding. Um, and so for those um, patients, there have been studies done looking um, at drugs that stimulate signaling through the normal receptor called the thrombopoietin receptor, which stimulates platelet production from stem cells. In the bone marrow, there is two drugs that have been studied in MDS, romiplostim and eltrombopag. Romiplostim is an injectable drug. Eltrombopag is a pill. Um, romiplostim got a little bit of bad press initially because um, there was some concern that it was stimulating blast cells. and they had transiently increased. There have been a number of long-term follow-up studies that did not bear out. Um, l trauma bag has been studied in two phase two studies with no significant increase in risk of leukemia. And this is an oral option. And these are the platelet responses, which you can see, um, you know, within days go up quite nicely, 47% um, versus 3% and a significantly reduced risk of bleeding events. So this is a really good option for patients with low risk MDS and low platelets as their main problem. Um, lastly, we'll talk about iron overload, which is um, uh, a problem in low-risk MDS. And so um, it's always been talked about that maybe if we soak up some of the extra iron, we can prevent long-term damage to the heart and to the liver. And so a phase three study was recently completed and um, presented, uh, published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, showing that patients with iron overload um, had decreased event-free survival. And that endpoint was a composite of liver damage, heart damage, and transformation to AML. So they kind of looked at a lot of endpoints together, which probably is a bit of a statistical tool to make a study successful. Um, but, um, you know, it's pretty clear that the iron levels as measured by the ferritin came down quite nicely. 
um, with the medication and there was some clinical benefit in a phase three study. So I think this is a very reasonable option. Um, coming to high risk MDS, um, the, this here, we're going to start hearing about a lot of the drugs that you've heard about um, from Dr. Dinner. Um, so I'll be a little bit quicker here. So high risk MDS is on the continuum to, be, continuum to becoming AML. And so we really think very quickly about transplant in these patients. For the transplant ineligible patients, um, the first line of treatment is hypomethylating agent, which includes decidabine and azacitidine, approved in 2004 and 2006, respectively. And after that, there was a real dry spell in AML with a lot of trials, none of which really were able to better or improve on the outcomes of hypomethylating agents. But finally, um, every dog has its day and we got a drug. So um, we got an oral formulation of decidabine um, in combination um, with cetazuridine. And so um, uh, cetazuridine is actually an inhibitor of an enzyme that rapidly inactivates oral decidabine. So in the past, um, attempts to give decidabine um, orally have resulted in very variable blood levels because it gets broken down so quickly. Um, and attempts to inhibit the enzyme have been pretty toxic. So this was a real breakthrough to have a combination of a drug with an enzyme that allows that drug to maintain good levels um, in, in MDS. And so uh, what they looked at was really th the studies that led to the FDA approval of this oral formulation of decidabine um, uh, were really comparing the pharmacokinetics of, of the two formulations, because it's exactly the same drug, but you just want to make sure that the levels are, are elevated. And the dosing uh, schedule is actually exactly the same. So it's five days, either IV or oral. And so the way the trial was done was patients got either the oral or the IV formulation in cycle one, and they switched in cycle two, and then everybody stayed on the or oral formulation cycle three onward. And a lot of these patients had already been on the IV formulation, suggesting that you know patients who are on a very stable dose of the IV formulation can be switched to the oral. So this is really nice for our patients now because instead of you know being on an indefinite treatment for which they have to come to clinic every single month, they still have to come to clinic to get blood counts and monitoring, but now their medicine can be a pill that they take at home for five days of the month. Um, so I think this is a, an exciting development and really helpful for the quality of life of our patients um, who, um, you know, have a disease that's going to require a prolonged course of treatment because majority of these drugs work for well over a year. Um, another, um, a drug that's actually really interesting for the subset of patients that we've all found challenging, whether it's an AML or MDS, is patients that have um, the P53 mutation. Um, and this, um, as Dr. Jenner mentioned, is a mutation that uh, is very important for cells to undergo death when damaged. And in, when this when this gene is abnormal, cells can take a lot of genetic hits and damage and not die. So you have the cells just collecting, getting a lot of damage from chemotherapy, but not dying. And so um, APR246 is a first-in-class drug that um, was recently presented at our annual ASH meeting um, in combination with azacitidine. Um, what this drug does is it binds to the mutant form of P53, so really the culprit protein um, that's not doing its job cell to die, and it changes um, structurally um, by binding to some of the residues, some of the amino acids in it, and shifting its equilibrium so that it goes back to the normal or what we call the wild type state of the protein and does its job, which is really arresting the cell cycle and causing the cell to die, which is apoptosis. And so and this is uh, this was really exciting because um, in, in the um, phase two study that was presented at ASH this past December, um, you can see here out of 45 patients, 33 were MDS patients and the overall response rate. And these are all patients that had a P53 mutation, 88% which is pretty much kind of unprecedented in this in this disease. And, and they actually showed nicely that the mutation burden as checked by the, the DNA sequencing went uh, became undetectable. So that's called um, molecular emissions. And those were seen in about a third of patients. Um, and a number of these, 52% went on to transplant. So, um, and the, the follow-up is pretty good, 10.8 months. So this is really encouraging um, data for a, a difficult to treat population. Um, Vanita Clax, you've heard about already in AML. Um, as this, uh, it was looked at in patients with relapsed refractory, um, um, sorry, relapsed refractory MDS, meaning patients who'd already been on hypomethylator and then it stopped working, um, which can happen within, on an average, one to two years. 
Um, and you can see that the combination had response rates of 40%, which is kind of encouraging because you just add on the venetoclax to somebody who's already on azacitidine. It's an easy enough intervention. Um, and you can um, rescue a third of them and put them back into um, some semblance of a remission and then prolong their survival secondarily. So um, that I think is, is interesting and important um, after progression on hypomethylator. Um, and then just talking about a couple of additional targets um, that are unique to, um, well, nedulation at least is unique to MDS. Um, so um, nedulation is um, a pathway that's relatively new and kind of seems more relevant in blood cancers compared to other cancers. It's um, a pathway whereby proteins get targeted for destruction. So normally um, there's a lot of turnover in cells and the cells have to destroy proteins, otherwise they accumulate and kill the cells. And so the way they do that is they put a tag on them called ubiquitin, and then they go to the, the garbage disposal system of the cell, which is called the proteasome. Um, so, and uh, nedulation accelerates this process by activating this critical enzyme called ubiquitin, cullen 3 lig ligase. Um, and so by um, nedulation with this drug called pavinetostat, um, abnormal proteins accumulate because they cannot move forward to the trash can and be destroyed. And so this is the early phase um, phase one trial of a patient getting the drug where you can see that the drug forms, this is um, pretreatment on the left and uh, post-treatment on the right. And you can see that the drug forms um, the adjunct with its target uh, after treatment and results in the accumulation of CDT1, which is a protein that should starts to build up in the bone marrow, and that buildup eventually causes the cell to die. And it was seen that um, it, that this drug synergized really well with azacitidine. And so um, at ASCO um, in June this year, they presented the results of the phase two study combining pevinistat with azacitidine, showing clear improvement over azacitidine alone. So um, it's been challenging to try and improve on azacitidine alone, and now we have a couple of combinations that, that seem to be kind of pushing the needle. And so this kind of just speaks to that point of Dr. Diener that clinical trials make incremental gains. We learn from our mistakes, we take what's successful, and we try to try to build on it. Um, and so this improved um, event-free survival, which is generally risk of progression to leukemia, overall survival was improved from 19 to 24 months, but this was not statistically significant. But the phase three trial is already completed and being analyzed now. So this might be an important drug um, in MDS. Um, lastly, uh, there were a few questions about um, immune therapy in, in MDS. Myeloid malignancies have been um, a little bit difficult to target with immune therapies, and that's because a lot of the antigen, immune therapy requires a really crisp antigen that it can target. And a lot of the antigens expressed on these abnormal myeloid cells are also expressed on healthy cells. So it's been a little bit difficult to target specifically the disease cells, sparing the healthy blood production. Um, but one unique mechanism that I think is um, going to be interesting is um, targeting CD47, which is um, an antibody that is expressed on cancer cells, and it um, tells the macrophages, which are cells that, that are part of what we call our innate immunity, and they're kind of swallow up abnormal cells. Um, CD47 is used to kind of um, uh, silence these um, eat me signals from the macrophages. And so when you um, use an antibody against CD47, the eat me signal gets re-exposed. And so the dial shifts in favor of opens up and swallows up the cancer cell. And so um, drugs targeting CD47 have been um, showing some good results in studies, um, first line treatment of both MDS and AML. Um, and um, the at this year, the showing some pretty nice responses in patients with MDS first line treatment in combination with azacitidine. So another combination and actually very minimal reduction in blood counts, which is frequently a challenge with azacitidine where the blood counts initially drop. These patients did not have much of a drop in the white cells and the platelets. Everybody has a little drop in the red cells when you start this drug because it suppresses red cell production initially, but that um, generally gets better with time. And um, lastly, I will just talk a little bit, uh, one slide about um, relapse because I, um, I saw there were a few questions about patients being concerned about how do I prevent relapse, um, especially after a transplant. And I think just monitoring of uh, measurable residual disease has become really 
um, hot in AML and certainly is is being looked at in MDS. And um, it's important that you know what markers are being looked at when you monitor for residual disease, but there have been studies looking at before the actual disease surfaces, if you can detect the mutation that was linked to the MDS, and preemptively treat before the blood counts start to change, then you can improve, uh, you can put a number of patients all shown here in the green and blue back into where the mutation becomes undetectable. And for those who become MRD negative, meaning the mutation becomes undetectable again after six or so cycles of azadine, the survival is much better. So surveillance um, for measurable residual disease in the context of a clinical trial is certainly being looked at both after treatment as well as after transplant. So there's a lot of targets being looked at. I think we've talked about a lot of these um, in MDS. And um, just in keeping with um, Dr. Uh, Stiff's request, I just put in one slide about a novel target based on um, the work that um, my uh, looking at a novel target um, in myeloid malignancies called FOXM1. Um, this was the work that was funded by the Leukemia Research Foundation. And basically, this is a, um, a gene that's over, it's a transcription factor, which means it turns certain genes on. A lot of those genes are important for cell division. And so we looked at patients with acute myeloid leukemia um, who were resistant to chemotherapy and needed multiple cycles of treatment to go into remission and found that their bone marrows had very high levels of this protein. We were able to quantify this with some digital microscopy techniques and show that it's statistically higher in resistant patients. And that made it an interesting target. Um, so then we tried to genetically deplete this protein. And when you do that um, and you treat the cells with cytarabine, which is kind of a mainstay drug in myeloid malignancy, especially AML, it becomes a lot more effective. And this is just a marker of increased cell death um, that you can see when you um, use the same dose of drug, but you take away this transcription factor. So. Now, this sort of is leading to attempts to use drugs to target FOXM1, and there's a few that we are looking at. Um, and with that, I will end, and thank you for the time and the opportunity to present. We are planning our annual town hall meeting, which is a Q&A style forum, kind of similar to what we had here at the very end of the program. So we will be sending all of you information about that as we have it together. Um, it's scheduled for January 31st. So thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful evening.